Good morning and welcome to all of you. It is so good to see so many familiar faces. As we gather into worship this morning, our call to worship comes from the words of Psalm 95, which speak about singing before God. And of course, those of us who are here must be masked and must remain, well, quiet, singing in our hearts. And so I would encourage you as we uh, sing the songs or as the praise team sings the songs to find a posture, a posture of praise, a posture of uh, submitting yourself to Christ, whatever that posture may be. Use the songs and the prayers and allow them to speak to you and let us enter into worship together. This past week, or I should give you a sense of the rhythm of my daily routine. Every day I, I wake up early, and my first task is to obviously eat my food, and then I have to bring my son to his workplace for 8 o'clock in the morning, and I have some time in between the time I drop him off and the time when my workday starts, and so on Thursday of this past week, I stopped by the Speed River, and it was the words of this psalm from Psalm 95 that came to my heart and into my mind as I sat by that trickling brook, and it is indeed a trickling brook right now, it's not really a river, but it was indeed beautiful, and the wonder and, and beauty of God's creation struck me again as I sat in the beauty of that spot. And so let us again listen to these words. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and with song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship. Let us quiet our hearts and worship. Let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are his people, the flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as we enter into the quietness of this space. We enter into the very presence of God, and let us join now together in a word of prayer. In the midst of all of the things that create in our hearts a sense of busyness or even a sense of being frantic, we come before you in the sanctuary in this place to rest. To lift our voices and our minds in praise to you. To hear again from your word and be reminded again of what it means to be your follower. We pray, Lord, that you would meet us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us in the whisper of this space, for we pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people say. I would like to invite the praise team up, and we will again raise our, or they will raise their voices, and we will raise our hearts in praise to God. We will hear the words from the song, Here I Am to Worship, Here I Am to Bow Down. You sit down into dark. 
friends in Jesus Christ, those who are here and those who are watching from your homes, we are welcomed into God's presence and so receive his welcome. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all and all God's people say, Amen. As we enter into now this time of confession, we're going to responsively read the words from, uh, are from the Psalms found in the back of the Psalter hymnal on page 1013. I hope you can read those. You are the bolded section and I am the unhighlighted section. Let's listen again to the will of God. And God spoke all of these words and said, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Come, let us worship Sorry, let's start that again. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Honor your father and your mother. Remember not the sin of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. You shall not murder. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. You shall not commit adultery. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. You shall not steal. Have mercy on me, O God. Blot out my transgressions. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me through your law. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Turn my heart towards your statutes and not towards selfish gain. Save me from all my transgressions. The Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries and he saves them. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Let us again in this time raise our voices, you in silentness, the praise team, singing as we sing ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you.
now to our children's moment. And Amy Barta will be bringing us the children's moment via video feed. And so if you could cue that up. If there's any kids out there, I invite you come join us for today's children's moment. Whether you're here watching from the church or at home, I'm really happy and excited to see you. I have a question for you. If you were going to learn how to ride a bike, I wonder what you would all need to do to be able to ride a bike by yourself for the first time. What are some of the things that you have to do? If you said things like, get on the bike, use your feet to pedal, learn how to balance on your bike, maybe start with training wheels or a balance bike and then move up to a two wheel bike. All those kind of things are right. And you have to practice, right? You have to be brave. You have to learn something new. You might have to listen to your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or an aunt and uncle who's helping you. You might need help at the start. And then all of the sudden, all of your practice and hard work, all of the sudden comes together and you're riding down the sidewalk all by yourself on your bike. And it's the best feeling in the world. It's so good. Well, we're talking a little bit about that kind of stuff today at church. Because when we say that we love Jesus and that we want to follow him with our life, it takes practice. We can't just say we'll follow Jesus and then never do anything. We have to learn how to, how to follow him. We have to put it into practice every day in how we live. So it starts with reading the Bible and understanding who Jesus is. It's learning from our moms and dads and other family members. It's learning from people at church going to Sunday school maybe and hearing more about who Jesus was. But then it's also putting it into practice. And that's why this summer we've done so many things to help you and your family learn how to put into practice how we can follow Jesus outside of our church walls in everything we do at home, at school, in our neighborhood, in our city, where we live, all those kind of things. So following Jesus takes practice. And I thought I'd share with you one story from the Bible that talked a little bit about how we're all different. We don't all have to look the same. It's going to look different for everybody. And that's okay because the Bible teaches us that that's the beauty of the church. So I'm going to read you a story from this book, the Spark Storybook Bible. And it's called Many Members, One Body. And it's talking about the church. So it starts by explaining who wrote this message. So it was written by Paul to Christians who lived in the city of Corinth. He wanted to help them understand how special the church was, including everyone in it. That means you, even though you're little, you're so special to the church. The church is like a human body. One body has many different parts, but it's still one body. We are many different kinds of people, but we're still one body of believers. If a foot said, my foot, if it could talk, if it said, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body. That would be silly. Of course my foot is attached to the rest of my body. It would still be part of the body, and if the whole body was an eye, could you imagine if my whole body was one giant eyeball? 
how then could it smell or hear anything? Because if I was just an eyeball, I wouldn't have ears or a nose. God made our bodies to have lots of parts, and each has something special to do. God made all of our parts to work together. The body of believers is the same. God has given each of you a special thing to do. Some of you travel to share the news of Jesus, and some of you teach right where you are. Some of you heal the sick or become church leaders. Is everyone a teacher? Is everyone a leader? No, that would be silly too. God made us to be different and to do different things to show our love for Jesus. Just like the different parts of one body, we all have different talents and we all work together. God has made each of us very special. So I want you to talk about this with your family. What are some of the different things that people in your family can do or show in how they love Jesus? What are the ways that even you, as someone who is just learning about Jesus, what have you learned about him that you want to share with other people? Maybe you like praying. Maybe you could pray today at home. Maybe you like talking to God. Maybe you like singing and dancing. How could you use that to show other people that you love Jesus? Maybe you're a good friend. How can you be a role model for other people to be a good friend? Maybe you're just quiet. And you can do something from home to show somebody else that you love them by making a card or sending them some little thing like you picked flowers and wanted to make sure somebody knew that they were special. Whatever it is, you have something to offer to the rest of the world and to our church. I hope that you guys have a great rest of your Sunday. Talk more about this with your moms and dads. And I just want to end by praying for you. Dear God, thank you for each one of these kids. May you bless and keep them. May you help them learn what their gifts are and how to share that with others. In your name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless and keep you guys this week. together uh, in a time of prayer just want to mention that a former member of our congregation uh, Arnold Franson suffered a heart attack last week um, he's stable but he's in the hospital he's waiting for surgery but he has pneumonia so he has to wait till that clears up we lift him up as well God called us to be a praying people we pray together in Jesus name our father who art in heaven we come gathered before you and we are grateful to be able to gather before you. You have told us that where two or more are gathered in your name, you will be there. And we have treasured that truth the past months. But there is still something special about gathering as a body of believers again, worshiping you together in this sacred space. We have worshiped you in our living rooms, kitchens, porches, parks, and you have met us there. Some of us now gather here, and we ask that you meet us here. We pray you also meet those still watching from afar in different places and different times through technological wonders that still allow us to virtually be together. We pray for Pastor David, the elders, deacons, ministry leaders, church staff, and those on the church life team. Give them wisdom to navigate these times. Give them vision, clarity, and unity as we seek your purpose for our church in this season. As ministries begin again this fall, but may look very different, give us patience, understanding, and enthusiasm. We thank you for the gift that Amy has been to us, and we pray for blessings upon her as she looks to serve you and others in different ways.
we lift up to you members of our communities who are hurting. We pray for the personal struggles, struggles that we and those around us deal with. Hunger, job loss, loneliness, addictions, mental health, cancer, and so many more. We pray for Arnold Friesen and his wife, Ida. Some of us have experienced loss of a loved one during this challenging season. We pray for an extra dose of comfort as we recognize how difficult it is to process grief with limited contact from others. Some of our congregation are grieving the missed opportunity that this pandemic has caused. We pray for families as there is much anxiety surrounding the upcoming school year. Yet we turn our eyes to you, Lord, to see the bigger picture. We see how you carried the Israelites through 40 challenging years in the desert, and we know that you will carry us through all of our struggles as well. We pray for the leadership outside of our church, our local, provincial, and federal governments. Give them wisdom to lead well and make decisions that will honor you. We pray for the global church during a time when restrictions and rules govern social contact. We pray that your gospel is still shared, that your message of hope will reach those who desperately need it. We pray for your name to be raised high, even when believers are persecuted. We raise up especially the people of Lebanon and Beirut during this time of crisis. We pray for their physical needs, for food and shelter. We pray for generosity of those around, for giving hearts and helping hands. We also pray for their spiritual needs. We pray for hope and comfort and peace. We lift up to you the racial tensions in our city and around the world. We ask that you reveal to us ways that we have been peace breakers instead of peacemakers. Open our eyes to see how we may be hurting people, even if unintentionally. Give us courage to take a stand against inequality. During a time of staying home, we sometimes realize how important your nature and creation can be. We appreciate the trees and birds, the water and grass, the wind and the sun. Encourage us to be faithful to one of your first commands, to rule and care for your creation, which you have left for us. We acknowledge times we have chosen convenience over care, and we pray for healing sustainability in our natural world. We pray for the eradication of COVID-19. We pray for scientists, researchers, and people working toward a cure. Give them wisdom, knowledge, and insight into ways to bring healing. Be with doctors, nurses, caretakers, and so many others on the front lines. Keep them safe, give them compassion, patience, and comfort as they work to keep us safe. Now, O oh great God, bless us through this service, through our fellowship time here and at home, and through the upcoming week. Anoint our eyes to look beyond the masks, to see your image residing deep within each person we meet. Anoint our ears to hear the cries of all who surround us, especially the needy. Anoint our hands to do gospel work. Anoint our lips to speak gospel peace, so that in all ways, in all times, in all places, we may glorify you. In the name of Christ Jesus alone, we are so bold to pray this. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy and Amanda, for that deeply moving prayer. <clears throat> and now as we come before God in, uh, through the word, we continue our prayer that God would anoint my lips and our ears to hear his word. Let us pray. As we've just sung through that song, ancient words, these words that come from your scripture, these words are living and true because of Jesus, and through the Holy Spirit, you will speak to us. And so we pray, Lord, that again, the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you. And hear our prayer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be reading from a number of different passages of Scripture, some of them in the body of the sermon, but let's open and listen to the words of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. 
You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable, entrusted to reliable men who will also be qualified to tr teach others. Endure hardship with us like a soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crop. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been asking this question. Why does church matter? What is so important about the fellowship of believers? I think this question is especially timely during this period of COVID. Not only is it especially timely during this period of COVID, it is especially timely as we consider how to make our way th into a new ministry season and how to do that with wisdom and how to do that safely. And so we've looked at that famous passage from the book of Acts chapter 2, that passage that is so familiar to us after uh, a number of weeks of looking at it. That passage that describes that early church being devoted to the apostles' teaching. This was a learning community. This was a community that in being devoted to the apostles' teaching were, were trying to think about the million and one ways in which the gospel of Jesus Christ is applied to life, every area of life, how we spend our money, how we use our bodies, how we live in relationship with one another. And so this group of people devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to centering their lives on the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that, that, that uh, the Son of the Father who came so full of grace and truth, who if we give our lives to Jesus Christ, will, will indeed direct our lives as we live in the beauty of his forgiveness, as we live in the message of the resurrection, as we apply that message of God's abundant grace to our own lives. Not only did this, that early church devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, they devoted themselves to gathering. We use the word, the Greek word, koinonia, to describe this kind of gathering, a, a deep kind of fellowship that, that bound this group of Christians together. And so this group of Christians would gather in the temple courts, and that's where they would listen to and, and think about the apostles' teaching. But not only did they gather in the apostle or in the temple courts, in that group of mo probably over 3,000 people, not only did they gather in large groups, they gathered in small groups as well, sharing meals with one another. This was a community of people that were, were bound together, sharing life, and while they shared meals together, they would remember the gift of God, the gift of God's sacrifice in Jesus Christ, the gift of forgiveness as, as they participated in the Lord's Supper together. And not only that, this was a community that was marked, marked, by generosity. Jeremy prayed about the generous spirit that uh, we are to have as Christian believers, and, and Luke talks about the generous spirit in, in Acts chapter 2, as people would sell their, their, their land and give or lay that, the monies that they had earned at the feet of the apostles. And those monies would then be distributed so uh, that there was no need in, those, in that group of people. And we are told that the Lord added to their number daily. Those who are being saved, there was something that so resonated with the longings of people, the longings for forgiveness, the longings for close fellowship, the longings for a kind of generosity that spilled over 
that the Lord brought into that church community an abundance of people. The question that we're asking ourselves to, today is this question. What does it actually take to do that? What is our part in applying the gospel message to every area of our lives? We, we know what God has done. We know that, that God has given us his salvation. We know that, that God has given us his promise, and he showed us this promise throughout Scripture that, that he is involved in his creation, that he will never leave us or forsake us. God has given us his salvation. He has given us his Holy Spirit, as we read about in Acts chapter 1. The Holy Spirit that will, will continue to spur us along, this Holy Spirit that will continue to comfort and that will continue to counsel us in the way of grace, in the, in the way of truth. We know what God has done, but what is our part in applying that message this is something I believe that the church needs to hear, especially during this period of COVID, especially as we enter into a new season of the church. And it is my prayer that this would indeed be a period of great harvest, where the longings of people's hearts would be met in the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that, that people would come into a saving uh, knowledge and a, into a saving relationship with this Jesus Christ who has reached out to them. And so we th read these words and, of, of Paul to Timothy. Timothy, this, this young pastor, this, these words of, of what it will take for, for Timothy to run the race that God had given to them. And, and Paul uses three metaphors that I want to land on. And those three metaphors relate to the three words in the title. Let me give you the metaphors. The first metaphor is of a soldier. The soldier doesn't uh, concern themselves with the affairs of civilians, but the soldier concerns themselves with, with, uh, uh, with their commanding officer. The second metaphor is a metaphor of an athlete. And the last metaphor is the metaphor of a farmer. And these three metaphors that Paul uses relate to these three words, discipline and devotion and commitment. The words that will allow us or that will, will spur us along in this life of faith, that will spur us along in what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Before we dive into those words, I, I want to do some cultural analysis for a moment. Here's a quote from Gore Vidal, who once wrote, Today's passions are for the immediate and the casual. Let me repeat that. Today's passions are for the immediate and the casual. And in his analysis, what he is saying is that if anything is worthwhile, it should be able to be acquired immediately at once. Once, once things have worn off, they are thrown into the trash heap. We live in a disposable world. This is what we are battling in our society in which we live. The mindset of our society is that there is nothing worth giving your life for. And because of that, it was my generation, Generation X, who came up with the movie Slacker. Nothing's worth fighting for, nothing's worth working for. As we think about our world today, we think about how it's easy for us to get people interested in the gospel, but what is much more difficult is, is to get them to stay. To get them to stay interested in the gospel, to, to get them to stick to it. In Eugene Peterson's book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, he talks about what it means to be a disciple. To apprentice ourselves to Jesus Christ, to, to apprentice ourselves to a master, to be a follower of King Jesus. And so the Bible talks a lot about what it will take to be a disciple. And another word that is equally as important is, is this word pilgrim. 
this word that, that carries with it this idea that, that our lives are to be going somewhere, that our lives are to be ter- directed towards someone. A disciple is a pilgrim whose life is directed towards Jesus. A disciple is one who has apprenticed themselves to the master. And so let us look at that first metaphor, that metaphor of a soldier. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Join with me, he writes, in suffering with me as a soldier. Join with me in suffering, we say. That doesn't sound that, that attractive, but, but as we think about what this metaphor means, as we think about what it means, takes to be a soldier. A soldier is is willing to sacrifice their own comfort. A soldier is even willing to sacrifice their own life for a greater good. A soldier doesn't concern themselves, Paul writes, or get entangled with civilian affairs, but tries to please his, uh, his commanding officer. And I think that this, this metaphor is, is trying to teach us that, that our lives ought to be submitted, that our lives ought to be submitted to King Jesus, and we follow Jesus Christ because not only is he great, he is also good. Write that one down if you're writing notes. A soldier follows their commanding officer not only because they have the ability to give orders, but because, and they will, they will stick to it if their commanding officer is good. And we know that our commanding officer is, is good because of how God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. We know that, that God is, has, will never leave us or forsake us, that God has our concern or our lives in his heart that he walks with us, that he will never leave us or forsake us. A soldier is willing to give up their lives for a greater cause, and for us that cause is union with God. We read these words in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but, but perfect love drives out fear. Let's read those words again. There is no fear in Love, but perfect love drives out fear. And of course, as the author of that book is talking or is getting us to imagine, he's getting us to imagine the perfect love of God revealed in Jesus Christ that has, has reached out to us, that, that drives us towards God, that makes us even willing to sacrifice our own lives for the sake of God's kingdom. I think about this in terms of my own role as a father, or as if you're a mother, you perhaps can relate to this. If your children, or if your child, if something threatened your child's life, you would immediately jump in to save that child's life. It's because you love them. It's because you are willing to sacrifice your own life for the sake of your child. A soldier doesn't get entangled in the affairs of civilians, but their concern is for their commanding officer. We put our faith in God because he is trustworthy, and he has revealed his love for us in Jesus Christ. The second metaphor that uh, Paul uses to this young pastor, Timothy, is the metaphor of an athlete. We read these words. Similar, anyone who, similarly, anyone who comp- competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. Now, I don't know how many of you know somebody who has become a professional athlete. I, I, I actually have a little bit of a sporty past, and, and one of the men that I used to play volleyball with went on 
to become a professional beach volleyball player. While we were playing indoor volleyball, I can remember that time where we played pepper. If you don't know anything about volleyball, and some of you will know what I'm talking about when I talk about pepper, it's this warm-up game. And I remember playing pepper with Rich Van Heusen. And this was a game to end all games. I, I, I actually thought my life was in jeopardy. He pounded the ball so hard at me, but it was such an invigorating game that I, I couldn't stop, and I loved it. How many people here know of a professional athlete? You are almost a professional. You are like, you know, number one in Canada in amateur uh, frisbee. A few years ago. Uh, that's that's a, a, a level that I haven't attained, number one in Canada. What drives an athlete to discipline themselves for their game? What drives them? I would argue that it, would, it is love for the game that drives them. And for a Christian, when we apply this metaphor for, to our lives, it's, it's our love for Jesus Christ. It's our, our longing for more of him. It's our, our longing to, to discipline our lives so that, so that his grace and his mercy become so natural for us, just like a basketball player doing a turnaround jump shot or a basketball player doing a crossover, how they practice that and practice that and practice that until it becomes so natural to them so that when it comes to the game time, they do it without thinking. What will drive us to pursue Jesus Christ like a professional athlete? It's because we, we love the game, and it's because we, we, want, to exi we want to exhibit the, uh, the, the fruits of God's Holy Spirit in, in our lives. It's because we love Jesus so much. And Paul would go on in that analogy, in that metaphor, to talk about how the athlete must play according to the rules of the game. They must submit themselves to the rules of the game. And for this portion of the message, I couldn't help but think about Lance Armstrong. All of us will, if you don't know Lance Armstrong, just keep your hands down. It's too embarrassing because Lance Armstrong is so famous that all of us should know. Waleen, you're shaking your head. No, you do know Lance Armstrong. Nod your head. Thank you. Even if you don't, nod your head. <laughs> Lance, Lance Armstrong, you will know that at the, age of the 40, at the age of 42 was stripped of seven of his Tour de France victory, uh, uh, victory wins that Lance Armstrong uh, walked away in shame, that a building that was named after him on the Nike complex was immediately after the scandal came out that he had indeed doped, that, uh, that, that, that the name of Lan that Lance Armstrong building was stripped from him. From him. And, and I would argue that Lance Armstrong had a misplaced love. He didn't love the sport of biking for its own sake, but what he loved was the fame that came from it. And, and sometimes that accusation, the accusation of having a misplaced love, could be applied to Christians. And here's what I mean by that. Sometimes when it comes to our faith, when it comes to this religious practice that we have, we can be accused of using Jesus for our own sake instead of following Jesus for the glory of God and for our joy. And I love that phrase. Following Jesus for the glory of God and for our joy. For there is indeed this idea that, 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 that life does flourish when we follow Jesus. Life does become more ordered. Life does become more disciplined when we follow Jesus. Life does take on the fruits of God's Holy Spirit, his mercy and his justice and his love when we follow Jesus. And of course, all of those things are great. But we do that because we love God. Jesus, just like an athlete uh, does his discipline, does his sport, because they love the sport. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules, Paul writes, and so we 
compete and we discipline ourselves. And the last metaphor that we land on is this metaphor of a farmer. I know there's a farmer here. You're visiting with us today. I have very limited experience as a farmer, but I do know a little bit about a farmer's life. When I was a teenager, I would wake up early and milk the cows and do the chores. And that lifestyle was not very attractive to me, probably because I like to sleep till about 7 o'clock. And a farmer's motto is that they get more work done before the, the time of 7 o'clock than most people get done all day. But a farmer, a farmer who plants, a farmer who feeds animals, a farmer is motivated by hope. When they plant their seeds in the ground, that seed which is just a tiny little seed, they hope that that one day that that seed will grow into a, 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 a plant that they can maybe eat or feed to another animal. A farmer works all day and puts their hope in the weather that the weather would cooperate in order that one day they will reap a harvest that they will then be able to use to feed their families. It takes hope. And our hope, our longing, our hope and our longing is in the finished work of Jesus Christ that, that one day all the earth will be filled with the glory of God. And so we purify ourselves, we pursue lives of holiness because we know that one day Jesus Christ is coming, that he will return and restore all things to himself and that his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven to its fullness. And so we devote ourselves like a soldier. We discipline ourselves like an athlete and we commit ourselves like a farmer to the work of Jesus Christ. And we pray that God's Holy Spirit would take over our lives and that the fruit of his Holy Spirit would be experienced in abundance. At the beginning, we asked the question, well, why does the church matter? Then we asked the question, well, how do we apply the teachings of Jesus Christ to our lives and I've, or Paul gives us three answers to that question. He says, discipline your lives, devote, yourself, l devote your lives, and commit your lives to the grace and truth of Jesus Christ that will propel you into lives of following Jesus Christ and in, into lives of building his kingdom. People of God, as we now come before God in this time of singing, I'd invite the praise team to come to the, for, to the front. Before they lead us in song, let us join together in a word of prayer. Our gracious God, we come to you today and we pray, Lord, that we would be devoted to you devoted to you because not only are you so great, but you are so good. We pray, Lord, that we would be disciplined in these walks that we have with you. May we fall in love with your grace and truth all over again each day. And we pray, Lord, that we would be committed, that we would be committed and that we would work towards your glory and for our joy. Lord, hear our prayer, for we pray in Jesus' name your son's name. Amen.
Once again, I need to give some instructions on how to exit the sanctuary. Uh, that is exit, our section number one. This is section number two. This is section number three, and we don't need to worry about section number four. We will again exit from the back and uh, go to the front, and we will exit by section. And so only after section one has left the building will section two then be permitted to go. You're welcome to go outside and fellowship with one another, but again, please remember the protocol around social distancing, and let's keep one another safe as we enjoy one another's company. May the Lord bless you and keep you.